Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel and if you're new here, welcome. My name is Lacey and this is my art channel. So in a video two weeks ago, I mentioned that I had a new idea for a series of videos on my channel. And while I am happy to have the new series of trying new art supplies, I'm even more excited for this one. It's what I call the Canvas Chronicles. My idea for this series is that we paint together, but I'm also going to tell a story. I've done a couple of videos similar to these, like the time I created a Dia de los Muertos spread in my bullet journal and talked about the history of Dia de los Muertos. I'll put the video in the iCards if you haven't seen it already. For this series, I want to try and stick to creating art on canvases, hence the name. I don't have a lot of experience with this, but we're going to see how it goes. And I will tell short stories that are public domain, meaning that they are free to use for the public. I'm going to do my best to fit the story to the theme of my drawing. I don't know if it'll always work out. Today's was literally just a coincidence. I had already finished painting the flowers. They reminded me of Autumn and I already had a website picked out that has short stories that are in the public domain. I searched Autumn and then there was one called Autumn Flowers and here we are. <laughs> I haven't even read it yet, so it'll be interesting to see how it goes. So let's just go ahead and jump in. Autumn Flowers by Alexander I. Kuprin. Published 1905. Translated from Russian by Douglas Ashby. My dear angry friend, I write angry because I can imagine first your stupefaction and then your anger when you receive this letter and learn by it that I have not kept my word, that I have deceived you and have suddenly left the town instead of waiting for you tomorrow evening in my hotel, as had been decided. My darling, I have simply run away from you, or rather, from us both. I have run away from that torturing, that awkward and unnecessary tension which unfailingly would have sprung up between us again. And don't hasten, with that caustic smile of yours, to accuse me of a saving wisdom, for you know more than anyone on earth, how that leaves me when I am most in need of it. God is my witness that, up to the last minute, I did not know whether I should really go or not. Even now, I am not at all sure that I shall resist to the end the intolerable temptation to have one more look at you. If only one more, even fugitively, even from a distance. I don't even know that I shall keep myself sufficiently in hand not to jump out of this railway carriage after the third bell. That is why, when I have finished this letter, if I can only manage to finish it, I shall give it to a porter and tell him to post it at the very moment when the train starts, and I shall watch him from the window and feel as if I were actually saying goodbye to you. That painful oppression of the heart. Forgive me. All that I told you about lemons and, and sea air and doctors who wanted to send me here from Petersburg was untrue. I came here solely because I was irresistibly drawn to you, aching to recapture a poor little particle of that burning, dazzling happiness which sometimes we reveled in prodigally and carelessly, like czars in fairy tales. From what I have told you, I think you must have gathered a rather clear picture of my mode of life in that gigantic zoo, which is called Petersburg Society. Visits, theaters, balls, my compulsory at home days, the charity bazaars, etc, etc, in all of which I must play the role of a decorative advertisement to my husband's career and business affairs. But please don't expect from me the usual tirade about the meanness, the emptiness, the flatness, the falsehood. I've forgotten how they put it in our society novels. I have been drawn into this life with its comforts, its good manners, its novelties, its connections, its associations, and I should never have the force to tear myself away from it. But my heart has no share in it. Some sort of people flash before my eyes, repeat some sort of words, and I myself do things of some sort. Talk about something, but neither the people nor the words reach my soul, and sometimes all this seems to be happening far, 
far away from me, as if in a book or a picture, as though it were all arranged, as Domnushka, my old nurse, used to say. And suddenly, in this dull, indifferent life, I was caught up by a wave from our dear sweet past. Did you ever happen to wake up from one of those strange dreams, which are so joyous that after them, one goes about the whole day in a state of blissful intoxication, and which are at the same time so feeble in themselves that if you've repeated them, not merely to a stranger, but to your dearest friend on earth, they would sound null and flat, almost grotesque. Dreamers often lie, says Shakespeare Mercutio, and my god, what a deep psychological truth there is in that. Well, then I too once woke up after such a dream. I saw myself in a boat with you, somewhere far out at sea. You were holding the oars, and I was lying in the stern looking up at the blue sky. That was the whole dream. The boat was rocking slightly, and the sky was so blue that sometimes I seemed to be looking into a bottomless abyss. And a kind of unattainable feeling of joy permeated my soul with such tenderness, such harmony, that I wanted to cry and laugh at the same moment from too much happiness. I woke up, but the dream remained in my soul as if it had taken root in it. With a little effort of imagination, I was often able to recall it and to recapture a pale shadow, at least, of my dream. Sometimes it would come to me in the drawing room during some lifeless conversation, which one listens to without hearing, and then I would have to cover my eyes with my hand for a moment to hide their unexpected gleam. Oh, how powerfully, how inevitably I was drawn to you. How that captivating magic tale of our love that flashed into my life six years ago under those caressing southern skies rises up before me, newborn in such moments. Everything comes back to me in a rush. Our sudden quarrels, stupid jealousies, the comic suspicions and the joyous reconciliations after which our kisses renewed their first fresh charm, the eagerly anticipated meetings, the feeling of sad emptiness in those moments after parting in the evening only to see each other again in the morning when again and again we would turn at the same moment and our eyes would meet over the shoulders of the crowd that separated us looking pink against the background of the dusky sunset. I remembered every atom of this illumined life, so full of strong, untrammeled happiness. We couldn't remain in the same spot. We were drawn eagerly to fresh places and fresh impressions. How charming they were. Our long trips in those antediluvian, stuffy diligences covered with dirty cell cloth in the company of gloomy Germans with red sinewy necks and faces that looked as if they had been roughly carved out of wood, and the lean, prim German women who stared at us with stupefied eyes and they listened to our mad laughter, and those haphazard lunches at some old good honest settlers under the shade of the flower-laden acacia hidden away in a clean yard that was surrounded by a white wall and covered with sand from the seashore. Don't you remember them? How ravenously we used to attack the stuffed mackerels and the rough sour wine of the country, indulging in thousands of funny, tender little betis like that historic impertinent kiss which made all the tourists turn their backs on us with indignation and the warm July nights in the fishing villages. Do you remember that extraordinary moonlight which was so bright that it seemed fantastic and unreal, that calm irradiated sea with ripples of silvery moire and on the lit up background the dark outlines of the fishermen as they drew in their nets monotonously and rhythmically all bending in the same direction but sometimes we would be seized by a longing for the noise of town and the hurly-burly of strangers lost in an unknown crowd. We would wander, pressing against each other and realizing more than ever our nearness each to each. Do you remember, my darling? As for me, I remember every minute detail and feel it until it hurts. All that is mine. It lives in me and will be with me always. To my death, I could never, even if I wanted to, get rid of it. Do you understand? Never. And yet, it is not a reality. And I torture myself with the knowledge that I could never live it and feel it again. Because God, 
or nature. I really don't know which. After giving man an almost godlike intelligent has, at the same time, invented for him two torturing traps. Ignorance of the future and the impossibility of forgetting the past with the equal impossibility of returning to it. On receiving the little note that I sent you at once from the hotel, you hastened to me. You were hurried and you were agitated. I knew it at a distance by your quick, nervous step. And also because before knocking at my door, you stood quite a long time in the corridor. At that moment, I was equally nervous myself, realizing that you were standing there behind the door only two steps away from me, pale pressing your hand tightly against your heart and breathing deeply and even with difficulty. And for some reason or other, it seemed to me then impossible, unimaginable, that at once, in a few seconds, I should see you and hear your voice. I was in a mood such as one experiences when half asleep, when one sees things rather clearly, but without waking up, one says to oneself, this is not real. It is only a dream. You had changed during the years. You had become more manly. You seem to have grown. Your black jacket suits you much better than your student's tunic. Your manners have become more collected. Your eyes look at one with more assurance and more coldly. That fashionable, pointed little beard of yours is decidedly becoming. You thought that I too had improved in looks, and I quite believe that you said it sincerely. All the more because I read it in your first quick, slightly surprised glance. Every woman, unless she is hopelessly stupid, will realize unerringly the impression that her appearance has produced. All the way down here in the train, I was trying to imagine our meeting. I admit that I never thought it would turn out so strange, so strained, so awkward for both of us. We exchanged unimportant, commonplace words about my journey, about Petersburg, about our health, but the eyes of each were searching the others, jealously looking for what had been added by time, and the strange life that was completely unknown to the other. Conversation failed us. We began with vu in an artificial, affected tone, but both of us soon felt that every minute made it more difficult and more stupid to keep it up. There seemed to be between us some foreign, a impressive, cold obstacle, and we did not know how to remove it. The spring evening was quietly fading. It grew dark in the room. I wanted to ring for lights, but you protested against it. Perhaps the darkness helped us in our decision to touch upon the past. We began to talk about it with that kindly, condescending mockery with which grown-up people allude to the pranks of their childhood. But the odd part of it was that the more we tried to deceive each other and ourselves and appear gay and indifferent, the sadder grew our tone. At last, we became silent and sat for a long time. I in the corner of the sofa, you in the armchair, without moving, almost without breathing. Through the open window there came to us the indistinct drone of the large town, the noise of wheels, the hoarse shrieks of the tramway hooters, the jerky bicycle bells, and as always on spring evenings, these sounds reached us, softened into a melancholy that was almost tender. Through the window one could see a narrow strip of the sky, pale as faded bronze, and against it the dark silhouette of a roof with chimneys and a watchtower that shimmered faintly. In the darkness I could not distinguish your figure, but I could see the shining of your eyes fixed on the window, and I thought there were tears in them. Do you know what comparison occurred to me while we silently reviewed our dear touching memories? It was as though we had met, after years of separation, at the tomb of someone whom we had both at one time loved with equal fondness. A quiet cemetery spring, young grass all around, the lilacs are blossoming, and we are standing beside the familiar tune, unable to go, unable to shake off the sad, confused, and endlessly dear phantoms that have claimed us, this dead being, it is our old love, my darling. Suddenly you broke the silence, jumping up and pushing your chair sharply away. No, you exclaimed, this is impossible, this is becoming torment. I could hear how painfully your voice shook. 
for god's sake let us get out into the fresh air or i shall break down or go mad we went out the transparent soft tawny darkness of the spring evening was already in the air enveloping with amazing lightness delicacy and distinctness the angles of buildings the branches of trees and the contours of human figures when we had passed the boulevards you called a cab and i knew already where you wished to take me there everything is as it once was the long stretch of yellow sand carefully pounded down the bright blue lights of hanging electric lanterns the playful exhilarating sounds of the military orchestra the long rows of little marble tables occupied by men and women the indistinct and monotonous talk of the crowd the hastily darting waiters the never changing stimulating environment of an expensive restaurant heavens how quickly how ceaselessly the human being changes and how permanent and immovable are the places and things that surround him in this contrast there is always something infinitely sad and mysterious you know it has sometimes been my lot to stumble on bad lodgings. Not merely bad, but disgusting. Utterly impossible, and in addition to this, to encounter a whole series of unpleasant incidents, disappointments, illness. When you change lodgings like those, you really think that you have entered the zone of heaven. But a week or so later, it is enough to pass by chance that very house and glance up at the empty windows with the white placard stuck on them for your soul to become oppressed by a painful languid regret it is true that everything there was odious distressing but all the same you seem to have left there a whole strip of your life a strip that you cannot recover just as before girls with baskets of flowers were standing at the doors of the restaurant do you remember how you used always to choose for me two roses one dark crimson and the other tea colored as we were driving past i noticed by a sudden movement of your hand that you wanted to do the same but you pulled yourself up in time how grateful i was for this my dear one under hundreds of curious eyes we made our way to the little arbor that juts out so impertinently over the sea front at a fearful height so that when you look down leaning over the railroad you cannot see the shore and you seem to be swimming in the air beneath our feet the sea was clamoring at this height it looked so dark and terrible not far from the shore large black angular rocks emerged from the water the waves were constantly rushing at them breaking themselves against them and covering them with mounds of white foam when the waves retreated the wet polished flanks of the rocks shone as if they had been varnished and reflected the lights of the electric globes sometimes a gentle little breeze would blow up saturated with such a long healthy smell of seaweed fish and salt ozone that one's lungs expanded from it of their own accord and one's nostrils dilated but something bad dull and constraining was more and more surely chaining us down when champagne was brought in you filled my glass and you said with gloomy gaiety well let us try to get a little artificial life let us drink this good brave wine as the fiery french say no in any case the good brave wine would not have helped us you grasped that yourself for you added immediately with a long sigh <sighs> do you remember how we used to be both of us from morning till night drunk without wine merely from our love and the joy of life below on the sea near the rocks a skiff appeared its large white stately sails swinging prettily as it dipped and rose through the waves in the skiff one could hear a woman's laugh and someone probably a foreigner was whistling quite in tune with the orchestra the melodies of the waltufel waltz you too were following the sails with your eyes and still looking at it you said dreamingly it would be nice to get into a little boat like that and go far out to sea out of sight of land do you remember how we used to do it in the old days yes our old days are dead it slipped from me unintentionally in answer to my thoughts and immediately i was frightened by the unexpected effect that the words produced on you you grew suddenly so white and threw yourself back in your chair so quickly that i thought you were fainting a minute later you began to speak in a strangled voice that seemed suddenly to have become hoarse how 
Oddly, our thoughts have met. I was just thinking the same. It seems to me fantastic, unreal, impossible that if it was really we, not two other people, quite strangers to us, who six years ago loved each other so madly and reveled in life so fully, so beautifully, those two have long since to belong to this world. They have died. Died. We returned to the town. The road ran through cluster after cluster of villas built by the local millionaires. We passed impressive cast iron railings and high stone walls behind with a thick green of platanes hung down over the road. Enormous gateways carved like lacework. Gardens with wreaths of many colored lanterns. Magnificent verandas. Brilliantly illuminated exotic plants in the flower gardens in front of villas which seemed like magic palaces. The white acacias had such a strong odor that the aroma of their luscious sweetness could be felt even on one's lips. Sometimes we experienced, for a second, a damp chilliness, but immediately afterwards we passed one more into the perfumed warmth of quiet spring night. The horses were running fast, their hoofbeats falling loudly in even time. We swayed gently on the carriage springs as we sat silent. When we were nearing the town, I felt your arm cautiously, slowly winding round my waist, and quietly, but insistently, it drew me to you. I made no resistance, but did not yield to this embrace, and you understood, and you were ashamed. You withdrew your arm, and I groped in the dark for your hand, gratefully pressing it, and it answered me with a friendly, apologetic pressure. But I knew that your wounded male pride would assert itself all the same, and I was not wrong. Just before we parted, at the entrance to the hotel, you asked permission to come to see me. I fixed a day, and then, forgive me, I stealthily ran away from you. My darling, if not tomorrow, then in another two days, in a week perhaps, there would have flamed up in us merely sensuality, against which honor and will and mind are powerless. We would have robbed those two dead people by substituting for our love of the past a false and ludicrous make-believe. And the dead people would have cruelly avenged themselves by creating between us quarrels, distrust, coldness, and what is more terrible than all the rest, a ceaseless jealous comparison of the present with the past. Goodbye. In the heat of running, I have not noticed how I have passed on to the old two of lovers. I'm sure that in a few days, when the first ache of your wounded pride has passed, you will share my opinion and will stop being angry at my escape. The first bell has sounded, but I am sure now that I shall resist temptation and shall not jump out of the train. All the same, our brief meeting is beginning in my imagination to clothe itself in a little cloud of smoke, a kind of tender quiet, poetic, submissive sadness. Do you remember that beautiful verse of Pushkin? Autumn flowers are dearer than the beautiful newborn ones of the fields, so sometimes the hour of parting is more vivid than the meeting itself. Yes, my darling, these very autumn flowers. Have you ever been out in a garden late in autumn on a wet, morose morning? The almost naked trees are threadbare and swing to and fro. The fallen leaves rot on the paths. On all sides is death and desolation, and only in the flower beds, above the drooping yellow stalks of the other flowers, the autumn masters and dahlias bloom brightly. Do you remember their sharp, grassy odor? You are standing, perhaps, in a strange listlessness near the flower beds, shivering with gold. You smell this melancholy, purely autumnal odor, and you are distressed. There is everything in this distress. Regret for the summer that has fled so quickly. Expectation of the cold winter with its snow and the wind howling through the chimneys. And regret for one's own summer that has so swiftly rushed away. My dearest one. My only one. Exactly that feeling has taken hold of my soul at this moment. In a little time, your recollection of our meeting will become for you just as tender, sweet, sad and poignant. Goodbye then. I kiss you on your clever, beautiful eyes. Your Z. I hope that you all enjoyed this story. I want to give a big thank you to everyone who made it to the end of the story. And 
I know that this is a very different type of video than I normally post, but it's a passion project of mine and I hope that all of you love it even half as much as I do. If you've made it this far, put your favorite flower emoji in the comments. Let me know how you feel about this series. I would love to know what you'd like to see me paint and I would also love to know what stories you would like for me to read. Just make sure that it's in the public domain and it's something that's not too long. I look forward to seeing all of you in the next video. Have a wonderful rest of your week. See you next time. Goodbye now.